Welcome to this week's transport vlog. Now this week we have to come inside because the Belgian weather has got the best of us again. Um, but this time as a real big treat, we're going to look at one thing, not two things, but three things that have happened over the last week or so that I think that you should be aware of. And it's going to be planes, trains and automobiles. And let's kick off with planes, first of all. Now, at the end of last week, the Dutch government announced that its planned uh, aviation tax will go ahead as planned in 2021 in January. Um, under its original plan, uh, passenger ticket sales would have to be uh, levied a charge. So you would pay seven euros extra for every flight going out of the Netherlands in order to make aviation pay uh, more fair uh, charges against things like rail and buses and so on and so forth. All part of the Dutch government's plan to go a little bit greener. It also included a tax for cargo flights. So um, companies would have to pay a certain charge per tonnage uh, going from Dutch airports. But they had to do some extra sustainability studies. And those studies revealed that it would drive away any cargo business that was coming in and out of places like Schiphol Airport, Maastricht, and so on. Um, so that's been scrapped. No more charges for cargo flights as of January. Instead, passengers will have to pay seven euros 45 extra. Um, now, aviation charges are also uh, something that obviously airlines do not want. And earlier this year, um, a lot of the industry were calling for any planned charges or even ones that are already in, in effect to be suspended because of the coronavirus pandemic. But with the Netherlands plowing ahead to this, there's about nine countries now in Europe that have all got some sort of aviation tax. And the Netherlands say that their charges are in keeping with those taxes. So they're on a, a level playing ground. Um, and the Dutch government said that they would deploy this tax if the EU did not come up with its own plan for one. So at the moment, you've got this sort of critical mass of countries that are willing to uh, charge passengers and in some cases cargo flights um, to operate the services. And you can imagine a future now where all of these countries bandy together in some sort of coalition and say, well, flights between our countries, because we both agree on this concept, on these principles, can now be charged. So you start to develop its own sort of, you know, this two-speed Europe that people have talked about in other, in other sectors uh, developing. And it would get to a critical mass where there will be more countries doing this than not. So at that point, you start to think, well, why isn't there an EU measure for this? It would be easier, everything would be harmonized. Uh, people would have more certainty about whether or not they're gonna be paying and so on and so forth. A few caveats for the Dutch plan. It doesn't include transfer passengers, which is obviously a big deal for uh, Schiphol in particular. It's one of Europe's biggest airports, a big transfer hub. Uh, a lot of traffic through it is people changing flights rather than departing from there. Yeah, so look out for that. There may be yet, I mean, the European Commission is going to revise all of its clean energy stuff um, at the beginning of next year or the course of next year. Um, and at the end of this year, it will also release its sustainable mobility strategy, which may include something to do with aviation. We're not quite sure how specific or detail heavy this plan is going to be or whether it'll be more of a vision for how Europeans should get about in the future. So that's planes. Uh, for trains, uh, EU negotiators finally decided that next year, 2021, will indeed be the year of rail. A fancy title for what is at the moment a unknown series of events and schemes aimed at making us travelers uh, take trains rather than other modes of transport, or at least take them more. That's the idea. The negotiators from the European Commission, the Parliament and the Council all finally agreed late last week um, on a preliminary agreement. So that's going to go through the normal process at the moment of ticking boxes and signing off stuff. Um, the main things that people were stumbling about were how much should member states be liable for in terms of payments. That's been, there's been an agreement there. The European Commission is going to have to look into two feasibility studies, one of which will be promoting a label for cargo goods that are shipped by rail, which should at least make it easier for businesses to use train services instead of sending their goods by road. Whether or not it'll make it cheaper or not depends on how this, this scheme is sort of designed. And the second one is to create a connectivity index. There's already something like that for air transport where you can see, you know, the, the links between airports and hubs are clearly mapped um, and you can see the best way to get there if there is a way to get there. And they want the same for rail, basically. It would be a very in-depth network map of uh, where is connected, where is not connected, where extra infrastructure is needed, where passengers are taking trains and so on and so forth. It has the potential to be somewhat of a game changer if um, 
all of these Green Deal aspirations and the night train resurgence that I've been beating on about for the last few months um, and people's desire to social distance and not be on a crowded means of transport. You know, trains have the advantage there because they're so much bigger. Um, if all of those things come together and there is the right money and political will behind it, maybe this European Euro rail could actually be um, some sort of catalyst for something. But we've seen these kind of things before, big schemes, big aspirations about making trains finally, you know, fulfill their role as a silver bullet for many of our problems, and it hasn't got to that point. But let's look on the bright side. We need a bit of optimism in our lives, I guess. Maybe the European Euro Rail will be a real, you know, maybe 2021 slightly better than 2020. Can't be worse, right? And then the third thing, automobiles. Um, and there's a very, this is a very niche one, actually. Ford. US car company famous for its Fiestas and its uh, GT40 Le Mans cars and all of this kind of thing, um, has announced the sales of transit vans, but electric transit vans. Now, the transit van is pretty much the archetype of the van. Um, it's used by builders, plumbers, uh, rock groups, uh, politicians to get around when they're campaigning. It's the van. Um, and Ford deciding to release an electric version of that. And also the main thing about this is that it is able to tap into all of this data that it's collected over the years about how people actually use these vans. Uh, because one of the main sticking points has been, well, we can't have electric vans because they don't have the range. Um, because the bigger you make the battery, the less storage space you've got. Uh, a small van is no good to trace people and a short range van is no good to people who need to get about certain distances. But Ford has decided that the battery size and range that will be in this new van is the sweet spot where it will be able to be used by anybody and everybody. So again, this is one of these real game-changing vehicles that basically ticks all of the boxes. And so long as there is enough infrastructure around for people to charge it. I mean, think about it. If people are using vans and they're going to construction sites or, or new builds and things, there will be somewhere to charge the van. More often than not, people have depots or um, bases to go back to so they can be used to charge the vans. They don't need uh, on-street infrastructure in order to get juice back into the batteries. So yeah, this is you know one of the biggest car companies, one of the most famous car companies in the world, deciding that there is a opening a niche in the market to sell this. And that's where you get momentum building for various other vehicles being put on the market as well. And finally, you know, petrol and gas and diesel being taken out of circulation. And that's the final chaser to this little uh, news update, if you will, is that the UK government is on the cusp of deciding and formalizing this idea that they will ban petrol and diesel car sales, new car sales, uh, in 2030 instead of 2035, which was the previous plan, which is pretty huge, really, when you think about it, that um, in fewer than 10 years, you will not be able to buy a new petrol or diesel vehicle, maybe a car, we don't know what exemptions or loopholes there will be at this stage, in the UK, one of the biggest markets in Europe for cars. So there we go, That's um, there are big movements going on in the car sector, there's a little bit of hope in the rail sector, and for planes, everything's up in the skies as usual. Um, thank you for tuning in, and uh, subscribe to my Twitter, subscribe to the newsletter, forward it to your friends, rewatch the vlog, like it, subscribe, all of the usual stuff. And thank you for watching again. And all of you stay safe and enjoy the beautiful winter weather. And I'll see you soon. Ciao for now.